uh, this is an excerpt from uh, a Borthway school book. And uh, if you have Borthway school books, they should be so well used that the cover has fallen off and they should have lots of sticky notes of uh, topics you've been interested in. This is about uh, the teachings and rights of existing religions. Imagine that we are sitting here talking of religions and that the maid hears our conversation. She of course understands it in her own way and she repeats what she has understood to the porter. The porter again understands it in his own way and he repeats what he has understood to the coachman next door. The coachman goes to the country and recounts in the village what the gentry talk about in town. Do you think that what he recounts will at all resemble what we said? This is precisely the relation existing between religions and that which was their basis. You get teachings, traditions, prayers, rites, not at fifth but at twenty-fifth hand, and of course almost everything has been distorted beyond recognition and everything essential forgotten long ago. For instance, in all the denominations of Christianity, a great part is played by the tradition of the Last Supper of Christ and his disciples. Liturgies and a whole series of dogmas, rites, and sacraments are based upon it. This has been a ground for schism, for the separation of churches, for the formation of sects. How many people have perished because they would not accept this or that interpretation of it? But as a matter of fact, nobody understands what this was precisely or what was done by Christ and his disciples that evening. There exists no explanation that even approximately resembles the truth because what is written in the Gospels has been, in the first place, much distorted in being copied and translated. And secondly, it was written for those who know. Those To those who do not know, it can explain nothing. But the more they try to understand it, the deeper they are led into error. To understand what took place at the Last Supper, it is first of all necessary to know certain laws. You remember what I said about the astral body. Let's go over it briefly. People who have an astral body can communicate with one another at a distance without having recourse to ordinary physical means. But for such communication to be possible, they must establish some connection between them. For this purpose, when going to different places or different countries, people sometimes take with them something belonging to another, especially things that have been in contact with his body and are permeated with his emanations and so on. In the same way, in order to maintain a connection with a dead person, his friends used to keep objects which had belonged to him. These things, as it were, leave a trace behind them something like invisible wires or threads which remain stretched out through space. These threads connect a given object with the person living or in certain cases dead to whom the object belonged. Men have known this from the remotest antiquity and have made various uses of this knowledge. Traces of it may be found among the customs of many peoples. You know, for instance, that several nations have the custom of blood brotherhood. 
two men or several men mix their blood together in the same cup and then drink from this cup. After that they are regarded as brothers by blood. But the origin of this custom lies deeper. In its origin it was a magical ceremony for establishing a connection between astral bodies. Blood has special qualities and certain peoples, for instance, the Jews, ascribe a special significance of magical properties to blood. Now, you see, if a connection between astral bodies had been established, then again, according to the beliefs of certain nations, it is not broken by death. Christ knew that he must die. It had been decided thus beforehand. He knew it, and his disciples knew it and each one knew what part he had to play but at the same time they wanted to establish a permanent link with Christ and for this purpose he gave them his blood to drink and his flesh to eat it was not bread and wine at all but real flesh and real blood the Last Supper was a magical ceremony similar to brotherhood for establishing a connection between astral bodies but who is there who knows about this in existing religions and who understands what it means? All this has been long forgotten and everything has been given quite a different meaning. The words have remained but their meaning has been long lost. This lecture and particularly its ending provoked a great deal of talk. Many were repelled by what was said about Christ and the Last Supper. Others, on the contrary, felt in this a truth which they never could have reached by themselves. There is uh, in the extant esoteric literature a drawing. Uh, I think I own it, but I have been able not to not find it in a hurry. Uh, it's uh, concentric circles um, describing higher and higher states of uh, consciousness starting at the center of the earth and coming up through minerals and sea animals, animals, human life and uh, then the various uh, yogi states and uh, superimposed over it is uh, a human being. I think it's supposed to represent, it's one of the Indian gods, maybe Krishna, and he has a string tied around his wrist going up to one of the higher levels of uh, consciousness circles. And that represents this technology. And by doing this uh, uh, what I have on this is that you are able to stay in contact for one full revolution around the sun uh, with the teacher and then uh, he's forced to move on. Also in another uh, discipline uh, it said that the spirit has a communication line like a wire like this from himself to every body that he ever created and uh, maybe some of you have seen wires while you're meditating or in higher states and these wires are uh, communication lines and if you've seen golden wires or if you've had golden wires preventing you from speaking this is the uh, lowest level of awareness of the uh, problems that human beings have. I've mentioned in an earlier series of lectures called uh, The Real Cosmology that human personality is world 96, has 96 orders of laws there and uh, surface of the uh, Biology on planet Earth is well 48 with 48 orders of laws. And uh, we're always heading towards uh, the conscious being. 
and uh, where this lecture is headed is to the moment of discovery of the small space and possibility wherein one makes one's first step as a conscious being. Uh, this comes after realizing and seeing quite clearly one's mechanical response, that one's life is a mechanical response to the outside universe. And getting out from under these laws is uh, possible, but this is an education that's been denied the public. Uh, the technology just mentioned is uh, a big deal the first time you hear it, but it's just part of the tools of the uh, people of the inner schools. And <clears throat> in that way, it's not a big deal. Uh, Baba Ramdas' teacher was dying of cancer, and this, he said, uh, we were all very upset that you're dying. Why don't you fix that? And the teacher said, uh, don't worry about it. I'm just getting a new body. I'm just it's like selling the old Ford and getting a new one. It's not really something to get upset about. So I'm going to... Uh, introduce something I hope will expand your viewpoint and then we're going to go back down into something smaller and see how it applies. This is about uh, the magnetic and electrical relationships between the planets and the communication between the planets plays out through the thin film of organic matter on this planet and the, the organic matter is the organ of reception like the back of the eye is in a human and we are part of that and we are subject to forces running through us of which we are unaware and we call them emotions and uh, there's also <clears throat> the play of planetary types or body types that are more attuned to a particular planet, which is a subject I haven't covered up in public yet, but uh, we're getting there. This is a lecture called The Solar System as Transformer. For a man to be fully conscious, all his parts must become fully conscious. For a sun to become fully radiant, all its planets must become radiant. For the absolute to remember itself, all beings must remember themselves. To those who ask, what is the purpose of the universe? We can thus reply that the task of the universe and of every being within it, from sun to cell, is to become more conscious. The figure which we have described as a network of interlacing, interlacing sheaths will no doubt suggest analogies to each specialist according to his study. What this is talking about is <clears throat> if you look at the solar system as moving through time, this is the sun goes along a path and the planets are whirling with it, not exactly around it, at different speeds and distances with different vibrations and colors, and that would give a figure. And some people have seen this from higher states, and uh, the general interpretation is I saw God or I saw a man with a white beard. Um, to the physiologist, for example, it might recall the interpenetration in the human body of various systems, muscular, arterial, lymphatic, nervous, and so on, each built up of fibers or channels of different size and each the bearer of a different energy. One of the most profitable analogies for our present purpose is that which will occur to the electrical technician. 
for stripping our figure of its sensuous membranes and reducing it simply to a geometric projection of spirals upon paper. He might recognize it as the diagram of a polyphase transformer. The mechanics universe of flying balls has left as trace in time an electrician's universe of coils designed, he would guess, for no other purpose but the transmission and transformation of solar energy. <clears throat> for the layman's benefit, let us recall that electricity has two measurements. The rate of flow, which is called amperes, and pressure, or volts. And those are the names of the people who uh, are credited with discovering those two uh, events, Mr. Volta and Mr. Ampere. And that a transformer is a device for changing the relation between these two factors. In a very general way, the heavier the machine to be operated, the greater amperage or power is needed. To meet such varying demands from a single source of power, the transformer increases the flow at the expense of pressure, or vice versa. This is done by cast passing a current of electricity through a coil of a given number of turns and allowing a sympathetic current to be induced in a neighboring coil of a greater or lesser number. <coughs> if the number of turns in the secondary coil is greater than the primary, the amperage or flow is decreased and the voltage or pressure is increased. If less, the opposite effect is produced. Practically, the flow or amperage is limited by the composition and thickness of the conducting wire. Thus, if it be desired to carry the power available on lighter wires, it must be first transformed to higher voltage or lower amperage. Now looking at our diagram of the tracks of the major bodies of the solar system in the light of these ideas, we clearly recognize the thick primary of the Sun, surrounded by eight secondary coils of its planets. We also see that the thickness of these planetary wires varies from one-tenth, which would be Jupiter, to one-three-hundredth, which would be Mercury the thickness of the solar primary. And in an 80-year diagram, we count in the various coils all kinds of windings from one-half to no less than 300 turns. Here we have indeed all the factors and components of an enormous transformer where receiving current at a given tension and stepping it up for delivery at eight different voltages. The model is complete even to insulation of the wires by a thin non-conducting film of planetary atmosphere. A transformer built in the human world from the specifications of this cosmic diagram would deliver current at eight different tensions and eight different rates of flow. And from the number of turns in the planetary coils during our standard 80 years, which is uh, one moment of perception for the sun, which is a way of measuring things in the conscious schools. We look at the moments of perception, shortest moments of perception of any being. We should be even be able to calculate the relative outputs. Suppose, for example, the current produced by the coil of Neptune from the sun's original power were one volt in pressure and 10,000 amperes in flow. Then Jupiter's output would be 14 volts and 770 amperes. The Earth's about 170 volts, 60 amperes. Mercury's at 700 volts and 15 amperes and so on. One effect of increased amperage in the planetary world 
seen by our perception is probably increased vibration that is a faster rotation of the planet on its own axis. If such a transformer were correctly wired with material of the same conductivity, the cross-section of wire suitable to each coil would be proportional to the amperage it carried. In fact, the cross-sections of the planets approach only within plus or minus ten times this requirement. But supposing the planetary coils do not to be of the same conductivity, Suppose their inner cores, as is almost certainly the case, to be of different metals, each of distinct conductivity. And further, suppose that those whose section is smaller than we should expect, such as Neptune, to be of metals of high conductivity, and those whose section is larger, such as Jupiter, of metals of low conductivity. Then, with the judicious attribution of the metals, silver for Neptune, gold for Uranus, antimony for Saturn, bismuth for Jupiter, copper for Mars, iron for Earth, strontium for Venus, and brass for Mercury, our apparent era would be compensated, and the vast machine indeed be accurate in all its measurements. The planetary coils, it seems, are rightly constructed to play their parts as transformer of solar energy in the way described, if only we suppose them to differ in their conductivity as metals do. It may be objected and admitted that metals are arbitrarily chosen to yield such a result. Unfortunately, the planets, not being themselves radiant, modern science has no means of verifying verifying their composition. And we can only note in passing that recent theories do, in fact, suppose the main bulk of the Earth, or barysphere, to be composed of iron. In addition, we have the traditional attribution of metals to the planets by astrology. But this has varied at different periods, and being made from an acquaintance with few metals is not very helpful. At present, therefore, we must place these calculations in the realm of suggestive speculation. What is much more important from our point of view is the principle that an electric current passing along a wire produces a magnetic field about that wire. This magnetic field consists of concentric lines of force moving clockwise around the wire when seen from the direction towards which the current is moving. In other words, the magnetic field rotates when the current moves forward, as a corkscrew has to rotate when it is driven forward into the cork. If we now try to translate this from the world of spirals seen in the sun's time to the world of spinning balls seen in man's time, we shall understand how it is that all rotating bodies in the universe create and are surrounded by a magnetic field. For their very rotation, as we saw just now, is an indication that they are sections of a line through which some tremendous current is passing in another dimension. I'm going to reread this, of course. For their very rotation, as we saw just now, is an indication that they are sections of a line through which some tremendous current is passing in another dimension. We shall also understand that a planet's speed of movement along its orbit represents in a recognizable way the speed of flow of this great current. For as we saw earlier, this orbital speed is a direct effect of the intensity of sunlight available that is indeed induced by the central energy of the sun. All the planets are thus individually surrounded by magnetic fields. The section of the wire around which the field of magnetic force rotates will be represented by the planet's equator 
while the planet's north pole will represent the direction of movement of the planet in time. That is, the direction of the great current which informs it. Thus the attraction of the north pole of a planet may be regarded as the attraction of the future. The attraction of the direction in which the planet with all its inhabitants is going. While the repelling effect of the south pole represents the repulsion from the past. The repulsion from the direction whence the planet with all its inhabitants has come. For all beings the future is the positive pole of time and the past the negative. They can do nothing else but be drawn towards the one and be repelled from the other. And I have a small note that I keep here on my computer uh, from uh, Dan Winter. Time is rotating charge. So if one had uh, scientists uh, look into this, you would probably come up with a uh, way to travel in time, and it would be electromagnetic. Now, these magnetic fields of the planets all overlap and interact. The combined effect of all producing constant minor changes in the individual fields of each. In practice, only the magnetic field of the Earth has been studied in much detail together with its effects upon it of the magnetic fields of the Sun and of the Moon. It is known, for example, that the Sun's magnetic influence on the Earth is about 12 times stronger than that of the Moon, or a field of 60,000 amps against one of 5,000. The magnetic influences of the planets have not been individually measured or distinguished, although the existence of such influence has been recognized scientifically in connection with the effect of differing planetary configurations on shortwave radio receptivity. In the case of the Sun, its magnetic influence is dwarfed to our perceptions by the far stronger influence of the vibrations which we feel as light and heat, and which are much more characteristic of the Sun. Nevertheless, this magnetic influence is quite distinct from light. For measurement of the delay between magnetic disturbances seen on the surface of the Sun and the magnetic storms felt as effect in the Earth's atmosphere, show that this influence travels at quite a different speed, whereas light from the Sun reaches us in seven minutes. Magnetic influences from the same source take between one and two days to be felt here whereas light travels at 186,000 miles a second magnetic waves travel at only about 400 miles a second or nearly 500 times more slowly what is the effect of this magnetic influence perhaps the most obvious and beautiful phenomenon which directly results from it is the aurora borealis or northern lights now this is interesting because in the aurora borealis we see pure light which is invisible itself first endowed with form this form constantly changes shifts transforms itself creating majestic curtains or shimmering spheres or pulsating fields of radiance in the northern sky the aurora borealis is almost completely insubstantial and is the result of magnetism acting directly upon free hydrogen ions. In it, we clearly see the effect of a magnetic field as form and changes in that field as changes in form. The same phenomena occurs when we place a magnet under a sheet of paper covered with iron filings and it imparts to the hitherto amorphous mass the visible form of its field. This, in fact, a general principle. Magnetic influence acting on matter is that which gives rise to visible form. 
Well, there have been a series of videos appearing. Uh, most of them are from Japan, where they've taken magnetic fluid or a liquid that is magnetic and influenced it with magnets. And uh, very often they come up with either geometrical or forms that look like nature. There was even one that looked like uh, a small pond with a tree beside it that had been just accidentally produced by magnets and magnetic fluid. And uh, mostly when they rotate the magnets you get uh, magnificent geometrical forms and they are uh, related it seems to the uh, uh, fractal geometry, fractal math. So we're slowly working our way into discovering how the universe actually works. Uh, we said that in the sun's case, although its magnetic influence is enormous, this is dwarfed by the far faster influence of light, which from our view is much more characteristic of it. But the moon and planets do not emit light of their own so that in their case magnetic influence is in reality their characteristic emanation. The combined magnetic influence of the moon and planets must then create form on earth. Just as the magnetic influence of the earth must in turn help to create form on all the other planets. Many interesting ideas about the role of magnetism arise from all this. If we study the different forms of energy we know, we see that each has a definite field of action depending upon its origin and its speed. Light, which travels at 186,000 miles a second, is produced by the sun and for all practical purposes is limited by the field of the galaxy. Sound traveling in air at one-fifth of a mile a second is produced by the phenomena of nature and is limited to, to by the field of the earth. While between light and sound lies this third form of energy, the magnetic, which traveling at 400 miles a second may be regarded as arising from the planets and limited by the field of the solar system. Light, magnetism, and sound constitute a clear hierarchy of energies, characteristically respective of a sun, a planet, and of nature. And they represent the means by which these cosmoses act upon us, by which the first endows us with life, the second with form, and the third with sensation. The picture of the universe which gradually emerges before the electrician is thus one of coils within coils, each transforming energy from a higher source to its own needs and capacity. The vast coil of the sun must transform its white-hot energy from the still more primary source of power in the core of the Milky Way. By induction, the Milky Way must produce current in the sun the sun in the planets, earth in the encircling moon, and by the sage wisdom in the pupil who faithfully revolves around him. That about which other creatures revolve imparts light and life. That which revolves is in turn endowed with magnetism and form. By this magnetism, it both participates in the giving of form to others and is in turn endowed with form by them. All magnetism affects all other magnetism. All forms create all other forms. From first cosmos to last electron, the whole universe is a complex of coils within coils, spirals within spirals, magnetic fields within magnetic fields. In this aspect, each creature transforms a single force to the exact tension required to drive a galaxy, a man, or a moat. And when its resistance decreases with the span of age, by this very tension, it is fused. The form of its magnetic field is dissipated, and it dies. 
Oh, this uh, analogy is uh, a way of discussing the concept that uh, the universe is a created environment and that all is one and things like that when you can't actually have that experience uh, yet so it can be discussed uh, intellectually there are other ways and other analogies of uh, looking at the structure of the universe um, the universe was created uh, from the outside uh, by a group of beings and uh, you and I are those beings so we have a sort of an in inside position um, we're not victims of our own creation unless you're asleep which is one of the things I'm leading up to. Um, these vast forces uh, play between the planets and the organic films and atmospheres are uh, part of the circuitry as is nature on the earth and the meat bodies that we inhabit are uh, Part of that nature but the spiritual spark inside is not actually under the control of planetary influences but if you're asleep to your actual nature and your potential you'll be living a life of reaction to uh, things that you receive through your senses, things you hear, things you smell, things you see, things you taste, quality of food, uh, the education you receive, the emotional environment you grew up in, and uh, accepting that as uh, quote unquote reality. Uh, we have what we have here. Uh, the point I'm heading to here is uh, when you have enough experience looking at the things that are occurring uh, to your body, your mind, and if you, when you can separate those from you, the observer, you have to ask yourself, who is, who is it that's, if you make a picture of a cat in your mind, and when you've done that, and you ask the question, who is looking at that cat, and from where is that being looking at that cat? So when you, uh, get to the point where you can see that you don't have to react to external stimuli you can realize at that moment that you've been asleep and asleep to your real possibilities and that you have never done anything that was not a reaction to external stimuli and this opens up the whole concept of what if you were to do first of all anything <laughs> and then to do something uh, conscious and uh, what would be the quality of the things that you did actually instigate and what would be your a moral and ethical thrust as a conscious being and in this business being is a verb uh, the dreaded church, uh, church of Scientology calls this this moment operating Thetan which they mean the Thetan they're using for, for spirit and well, what is the spirit doing? Well, for the first time, he's actually operating as himself. 
for the first time in trillions of years. And uh, it's a beautiful moment. It's very quiet. It's it's quite a revelation to realize you have no idea what your powers might even be. And they might be limitless. And if they were limitless, could you confront that? What would you do with that? Which is why uh, it's not possible to uh, get to these states if you're unethical or evil. They're just not accessible to someone who's that uh, caved in. Let's put it that way. So uh, much of the work of conscious schools is to get you separated from the mechanical in and out of these forces I just discussed and many others. There are 48 orders of laws on the planet Earth. And there's some of these laws that are really gravity and breathing. And there are nine, uh, double that number 96 in human personality uh, orders of laws and it's possible since this is a manufactured environment to be free of all of those it's possible to step off the merry-go-round and look at it and realize it's a merry-go-round uh, and by the way driven by electricity flowing through wires Uh, from the uh, the Gurdjieff School, Fourth Way School. Although he undoubtedly gave the fundamental basis for the study of the role and the significance of negative emotions, as well as methods of struggling against them, referring to non-identification, non-considering and not expressing negative emotions. He did not complete these theories at this time, nor did he explain that negative emotions were entirely unnecessary and that no normal center for them existed. Therefore, they are mechanical manifestations. A question from a student, how should evolution be understood? The evolution of man can be taken as a development in him of those powers and possibilities which never develop by themselves, that is, mechanically. Only this kind of development, only this kind of growth marks the real evolution of man. There is and there can be no other kind of evolution, whatever. We have before us man at the present moment of his development. Nature has made him such as he is and in large masses so far as we can see. And as far as we can see, such he will remain. Changes likely to violate the general requirements of nature can only take place in separate units. This means you. In order to understand the law of man's evolution, it is necessary to grasp that beyond a certain point. This evolution is not at all necessary. That is to say, it is not necessary for nature at a given moment in its own development. To speak more precisely, the evolution of mankind corresponds to the evolution of the planets. But the evolution of the planets proceeds for us in infinitely prolonged cycles of time. Throughout the stretch of time that human thought can embrace, no essential changes can take place in the life of the planets, and consequently no changes can take place in the life of mankind. Humanity neither progresses nor evolves. What seems to us to be progress or evolution 
is a partial modification which can be immediately counterbalanced by a corresponding modification in an opposite direction. Humanity, like the rest of organic life, exists on earth for the needs and purposes of the earth and is exactly as it should be for the earth's requirements at the present time. Only thought as theoretical and as far removed from fact as modern European thought could have conceived the evolution of man to be possible apart from surrounding nature, or have regarded the evolution of man as a gradual conquest of nature. This is quite impossible. In living, in dying, in evolving, in degenerating, man equally serves the purposes of nature, or rather, nature makes equal use, though perhaps for different purposes, of the products of both evolution and degeneration. And at the same time, humanity as a whole can never escape from nature, for even in struggling against nature, a man acts in conformity with their purposes. The evolution of large masses of humanity is opposed to nature's purposes. The evolution of a certain small percentage may be in accord with nature's purposes. Man contains within him the possibility of evolution. But the evolution of humanity as a whole, that is the development of these possibilities in all men, or in most of them, or even a large number of them, is not necessary for the purposes of the earth or of the planetary world in general and it might in fact be injurious or fatal there exist therefore special forces of a planetary character which oppose the evolution of large masses of humanity and keep it at the level it ought to be Now, for example, every time the world gets close to having a spiritual uh, revolution where these ideas come out, a war starts, as is happening now. And this might be the uh, instance of the earth uh, stirring up men to prevent this kind of thing from happening. For instance, the evolution of humanity beyond a certain point, or to speak more correctly, above a certain percentage, would be fatal for the moon. The moon at present feeds on organic life, on humanity. Humanity is a part of organic life. That means that humanity is food for the moon. If all men were to become too intelligent, they would not want to be eaten by the moon. But at the same time, possibilities of evolution exist and they may be developed in separate individuals with the help of appropriate knowledge and methods. Such development can take place only in the interest of the man himself, so to speak. The interests and forces of the planetary world. The man must understand this. His evolution is necessary only to himself. No one else is interested in it, and no one is obliged or intends to help him. On the contrary, the forces which oppose the evolution of large masses of humanity also oppose the evolution of individual men. A man must outwit them, and one man can outwit them. Humanity cannot. You will understand later on that all these obstacles are very useful to a man. If they did not exist, they would have to be created intentionally because it is by overcoming obstacles that man develops those qualities he needs. And one of the books that's available uh, in this study is by Peter Ospensky and its title is The Psychology of Man's Possible Evolution. And it's like a course book for a course that would be called The Psychology of Man's Possible Evolution, and it means exactly what it says. The advantage of the separate individual is that he is very small, and that in the economy of nature, it makes no difference whether there is one mechanical 
man more or less. We can easily understand this correlation of magnitudes if we imagine the correlation between a microscopic cell and our own body. The presence or absence of one cell will change nothing in the life of the body. We cannot be conscious of it and it can have no influence on the life and functions of the organism. In exactly the same way, a separate individual is too small to influence the life of the cosmic organism to which he stands in the same relationship with regard to size as a cell stands to our own organism. And this is precisely what makes his evolution possible. And this, on this are based his possibilities. And in speaking of evolution, it is necessary to understand from the outset that no mechanical evolution is possible. The evolution of man is the evolution of his consciousness, and consciousness cannot evolve unconsciously. The evolution of man is the evolution of his will, and will cannot evolve involuntarily. The evolution of man is the evolution of his power of doing, and doing cannot be the result of things which happen. People do not know what man is. They have to do with a very complex machine, far more complex than a railway engine, a motor car, or an airplane. But they know nothing or almost nothing about the construction, working, or possibilities of this machine. They do not even understand its simplest functions because they do not know the purpose of these functions. They vaguely imagine that a man should learn to control his machine, just as he has to learn to control a railway engine, a motor car, or an airplane. And that incompetent handling of the human machine is just as dangerous and incompetent as handling any other complex machine. Everybody understands this in relation to an airplane, a motor car, or a railway engine. But it is very rarely that anyone takes this into account in relation to man in general or to himself in particular. It is considered right and legitimate to think that nature has given men the necessary knowledge of their machine, and yet men understand that an instinctive knowledge of the machine is by no means enough. Why do they study medicine and make no use of its services? because, of course, they realize they do not know their machine. But they do not suspect that it can be known much better than science knows it. They do not suspect that then it would be possible to get quite different work out of it. Imagination is one of the principal sources of the wrong work of centers. Each center has its own form of imagination and daydreaming. But as a rule, both the moving and the emotional centers make use of the thinking center, which very readily places itself at their disposal for this purpose. Because daydreaming corresponds to its own inclinations. Daydreaming is absolutely the opposite of useful mental activity. Useful in this case means activity directed towards a definite aim and undertaken for the sake of obtaining a definite result. Daydreaming does not pursue any aim, does not strive after any result. The motive for daydreaming always lies in the emotional or in the moving center. The actual process is carried out by the thinking center. The inclination to daydream is due partly to the laziness of the thinking center, that is, its attempts to avoid the effort connected with work directed towards a definite aim and going in a definite direction, and partly to the tendency of the emotional and the moving centers to repeat to themselves, to keep alive or to recreate experience both pleasant and unpleasant emotions that have been previously lived through or imagined. Daydreaming of disagreeable, morbid things is very characteristic of the unbalanced state of the human machine. 
After all, one can understand daydreaming of a pleasant kind and find logical justification for it. Daydreaming of an unpleasant character is an utter absurdity. And yet many people spend nine-tenths of their lives in just such painful daydreams about misfortunes which may overtake them or their family, about illnesses they may contract or sufferings they will have to endure. Imagination and daydreaming are instances of the wrong work of the thinking center. Observation of the activity of imagination and daydreaming forms a very important part of self-study, which is when you study yourself, not daydream about studying yourself. The next object of self-observation must be habits in general. Every grown-up man consists wholly of habits, although he is often unaware of it and even denies having any habits at all. This can never be the case. All three centers are filled with habits, and a man can never know himself until he has studied all his habits. The observation and the study of habits is particularly difficult because in order to see and record them, one must escape from them, to free oneself from them, if only for a moment. So long as a man is governed by a particular habit, he does not observe it. But at the very first attempt, however feeble to struggle against it, he feels it and notices it. Therefore, in order to observe and study habits, one must try to struggle against them. This opens up a practical method of self-observation. It has been said before that man cannot change anything in himself, that he can only observe and record. This is true. But it is also true that a man cannot observe and record anything if he does not try to struggle with himself, that is, with his habits. This struggle cannot yield direct results. That is to say, it cannot lead to any change, especially to any permanent and lasting change. But it shows what is there. Without a struggle, a man cannot see what he consists of. The struggle with small habits is difficult and boring, but without it, self-observation is impossible. Even at the first attempt to study the elementary activity of the moving center, a man comes up against habits. For instance, a man may want to study his movements, may want to observe how he walks, but he will never succeed in doing so for more than a moment if he continues to walk in the usual way. But if he understands that his usual way of walking consists of a number of habits, for instance, of taking steps of a certain length, walking at a certain speed, and so on, he tries to alter them, that is, to walk faster or slower, to take bigger or smaller steps. He will be able to observe himself and to study his movements as he walks. Now, the, the school I was in, the teacher was a man number seven, and he said the most he ever learned was during the time his teacher made him change the way he walked. If a man wants to observe himself when he is writing, he must take note of how he holds his pen and try to hold it in a different way from usual. Observation will then become possible. In order to observe himself, a man must try to walk, not in his habitual way. He must sit in unaccustomed attitudes. He must stand when he is accustomed to sit. He must sit when he is accustomed to stand. And he must make with his left hand the movements he is accompanied accustomed to make with his right hand and vice versa. This will enable him to observe himself and to study the habits and associations of the moving center. And I tried uh, writing everything with my left hand, which I can do amazingly, and uh, I learned a lot doing that. You can try things like that. <clears throat> In the sphere of emotion, it is very useful to try to struggle with the habit of giving immediate expression to all one's unpleasant emotions. 
Many people find it very difficult to refrain from expressing their feelings about bad weather. It is still more difficult for people not to express unpleasant emotions when they feel that something or someone is violating what they consider or conceive to be order or justice. Besides being a very good method for self-observation, the struggle against expressing unpleasant emotions has at the same time another significance. It is one of the few directions in which a man can change himself or his habits without creating other undesirable habits. Therefore, self-observation and self-study must from the first be accompanied by the struggle against the expression of unpleasant emotions. If he carries out all these rules while observing himself, a man will record a whole series of very important aspects of his being. To begin with, he will record with unmistakable clearness the fact that his actions thoughts, feelings, and words are the result of external influences and that nothing comes from himself. He will understand and see that he is in fact an automaton acting under the influence of external stimuli. He will feel his complete mechanicalness. Everything happens. He cannot do anything. He is a machine controlled by accidental shocks from outside. Each shock calls to the surface one of his new eyes. A new shock, and that eye disappears, and a different one takes its place. Another small change in the environment, and again there is a new eye. A man will begin to understand that he has no control of himself whatever that he does not know what he may say or do the next moment. He will begin to understand that he cannot answer for himself even for the shortest length of time. He will understand that if he remains the same and does nothing unexpected, it is simply because no unexpected outside changes are taking place. He will understand that his actions are entirely controlled by external conditions and he will be convinced that there is nothing permanent in him from which he could control could come not a single permanent function not a single permanent state it must be noted that the organism usually produces in the course of one day all the substances necessary for the following day and it very often happens that all these substances are spent or consumed upon some unnecessary and as a rule unpleasant emotion. Bad moods, worry, the expectation of something unpleasant, doubt, fear, a feeling of injury, irritation. Each of the emotions in reaching a certain degree of intensity may in half an hour or even half a minute consume all the substances prepared for the next day, while a single flash of anger or some other violent emotion can at once explode all the substances prepared in a laboratory and leave a man quite empty inwardly for a long time or even forever. All psychic processes are material. There is not a single process that does not require the expenditure of certain substances corresponding to it. If this substance is present, the process goes on. When the substance is exhausted, the process comes to a stop. In one of my uh, early lectures, I mentioned that this kind of knowledge is material. And there isn't enough material to go around for everybody on the planet. Uh, and as you've just heard, it's not possible for all of mankind to wake up. So those things sort of uh, run logically parallel. However, uh, I would uh, in join you to uh, get it while it's hot and do something with it because we only have 
this brief moment in eternity to uh, pull something off for the benefit of the larger sleeping group. Now I did say that uh, <laughs> because of the end of the world is coming up in about 40 days and I would take the kid gloves off. So I had uh, a very weird day last year. Something was wrong. Something was going on. It was something, uh, an upset in the forest and it lasted an entire day. And about 6.30 on that day, I realized what it was. It was the earth was trying to get a hold of me. <laughs> and uh, the earth approves of what I'm doing. So I got a hold of my uh, upline guy and said, this is what happened to me today. And he uh, said, uh, yeah. <laughs> Not a problem. Um... So, with reference to what is in this lecture earlier, that the evolution of large groups of mankind is not necessary or wanted by the Earth. If you're uh, <clears throat> hearing this lecture or these lectures, it's uh, good luck on your part. And uh, please take some action. Uh, Many are called, few are chosen, and billions are completely ignored, so... Cast not thy seed upon the ground. Uh, related to those remarks, years ago I uh, asked the Yi Jing, how come my life is so strange, and uh, I don't seem to be able to uh, fit in to normal societal molds and the answer I got was a thing called the wanderer which I will quote here whatever greatness may exhaust itself upon this much is certain it loses its home hence there follows the hexagram of the wanderer <laughs> 